Hey everybody, I'm excited. It's that time once again, Sunday night. Well, this is not once again, this is the first time we're doing this. A Sunday night at 6 p.m., you are about to get a word that is about to bless your life. And listen, if this, if the takeoff of this series is any evidence of what God is about to do over the next few weeks, I just have a firm feeling that he is about to wreck us every single service. Last week we talked about trust issues. Tonight I'm talking about can you please hurry up. This is our Try Me series. The first lesson was about try trust. Tonight is about try patience. Let's get to the message. <laughs> Well, hello everybody once again. I'm excited. It's the first time we're streaming live on Sunday night. It's about to go up on a Sunday night. If you would, join me and let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Familiar passage of scripture depending on where you are in your Christian journey. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to read um, roughly verses 4 through 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Verse 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trust, always hopes, always perseveres, and our verse of consideration and where we're going to park for the time that we have together on tonight is just three words in verse four, and that is love is patient. Father God, I thank you that you use me in this moment to touch the hearts of your people. Like always, oh God, anoint my lips to be the PA system of heaven, the soundtrack of heaven. We are coming because we are in high expectation that you are going to give a life-changing word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody in the room say amen. Amen. Well, I am ready, and I hope that you're ready because just a few days ago, you were given your boarding pass. You were given your boarding pass to come on board with me as we started this brand new series entitled Try Me. And I just have to be honest, if Thursday was just an indication, if the takeoff of this series was just an indication of what's going to happen throughout this flight, I know God is going to wreck us and we're going to have some transforming testimonies after this series. Somebody say, Try Me. Thursday, we came together. And we had a needed conversation around trust issues. And we discovered that many times the reason we have trust issues is not necessarily due to God, but rather due to misplaced people that we have trusted. In other words, we have issued trust to people who have never shown themselves trustworthy. So if we had a father that was never there, sometimes that could bleed over in our faith and we begin to wonder, is God really going to be there? And so we have all of these trust issues usually due to misplaced people. We talked about that because we have to understand if you are going to guard your heart with all, with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life, the number one way you could do that is you're going to have to learn how to put people in their place. I'm not talking about checking nobody or charging anybody up. It's being able to know my pawn from my partner from my parasite to my project. Pain is imminent. We will experience heartache and heartbreak and unnecessary pain when we can't discern that this is not a partner, this is a parasite. Uh -uh, this is not a partner, this is a project. No, ma'am, this is not a partner, this is a pawn. When we don't understand the difference between the two, that's when we end up getting hurt. And Jesus shows us this wise relational discerning skill during his life. He spoke to thousands. Watch this. He spoke to thousands, sent out 72, selected 12, but was vulnerable with three. Did you hear what I just said? 
He spoke to thousands, sent out 72, selected 12, but was vulnerable with three. He did not take the thousand to the mountaintop of transfiguration with him. He took nine to the mountaintop. He took three to the mountaintop and left nine in the valley. And I think now we have to ask ourselves, can we discern our mountaintop ones from our valley ones? Can we discern which one is which? Because if we don't know, we'll end up being vulnerable with Judas the betrayer versus John the beloved. John has your back. Judas going to stab you in the back. Can you identify which one? Because if you don't and if you can't, you risk being vulnerable with the wrong one. These are the type of people when they've discovered your issue or your weakness, they're not going to turn it into a prayer project. They're going to use it as ammunition or blackmail. And then what will happen is that friend that had an ear in one season will become an enemy with the mouth in the next season. So we have to be able to have discernment. And we discussed this. We said needed discernment. Needed discernment is God's way of calling us into intercession. You're going to have to pray on this one, bruh. You're going to have to pray on this, ma'am. If you didn't have a prayer life, you're going to have one today because discernment removes presentation. And if you're like me, I've discovered a lot of people present themselves wearing a mask. And some opportunities are really traps playing dress up. And I need to know, I need God to perform a heavenly MRI on this situation, on this opportunity, on this relationship, on this endeavor, on this person. Because I need to know if this is God's will for my life. I need discernment. So many times discernment also will help you to discern is this person do they really have a bad heart or are they just having a bad day I need discernment this is one I could like I need to take my time with them because they're just having a bad day this isn't the normal character and discernment helps you to understand that and we talked about trust issues in depth and since trust issues that we've had with people has the possibility of bleeding over into our trust issues in faith, our trust issues with God, we now will question God when he gives us Leah. We'll question him because we want Rachel, but God wants us to have Leah. If you missed the message, listen, stop right here. Pause this. This is going to be up later. You go and you watch part one where you can understand what we're talking about. And so I just feel led... And I just think it's appropriate for the time that we have together on tonight. I would like to speak from this thought around this subject. Can you please hurry up? Can you please hurry up? Can I get everybody with all caps type that in the room? Can you please hurry up? I need you to type in like you were in traffic and somebody you were just nice being a nice driver and let somebody get in front of you. And then they have the audacity to drive slow. Can you please hurry up? That's a word in itself. Brothers, if we're going to put our signal on and ask to get in front of somebody, please go at an accelerated pace. Please go at an accelerated pace because you're the one that decided to get in front. And ladies have an issue when you are calling yourself a leader, but you're not being led yourself. There's nothing more dangerous than a confused man because there's no, no telling where he's going to take us. And ladies, we have to be cautioned and we have to be aware. Don't let them get in front if they have to slow down your spiritual growth. How we get all of that from a traffic example? <laughs> Can you please hurry up? Now listen, the purpose and the point of this whole series, point number one, when we talked about trust issues, I was really trying to get you to understand maybe you should try trust. You try doubt. You've tried worry, but why not try trust? And every single message, I'm going to be trying to implore you to try something that you probably haven't tried before, or you need to try again. Part one was try trust. Can you please hurry up? Let's deal with tonight. Try patience. Yeah. Try patience. Because as I was studying this, I was telling my wife, you say, you know what I'm discovering? Maybe some people are mislabeling it. Maybe we don't have trust issues. We have a patient issue. Because the longer you wait, the more you doubt. The longer you wait, the more you doubt. And you're saying, I got trust issues. I want to ascribe to you. Maybe it's a patient issue. Because the longer the delay seems, and the longer it seems as though your shipping is taking its time to get to you for whatever prayer that you ask God, we begin to question if it'll ever happen. And now we begin to doubt. So maybe you don't have trust issues. You have a patient issue. Y'all ready for this? Coming for your life once again. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, 
I believe that this particular message, this is one of the most necessary and powerful messages because we're really talking about the power of patience. The power of patience because one of love's attributes is patience. And we've talked about before the love languages and love tanks and love banks. And if there's somebody watching this message, you're probably like, okay, you lost me. I know we're talking about patience, but now you're talking about love. So what does love and patience really have to do with one another? What does my patience ability have to do with my love ability? And I will simply respond to you by saying everything. Everything, our foundational text in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, lets us know that love is patient. I want you to see how these merge. Love is patient. Then Jesus tells us, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples by the way you, what's that word? Love one another. So let's change it. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by how patient you are. Ah... Yeah, all men will know that you are really a Christ follower due to your patience, due to your ability to not keep a record of wrong, due to your trust, due to your perseverance. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the way we love one another. And since our love, since our litmus test of love is really tied to if I'm really a Christ follower, I have to love people. If I'm really a Christ follower, I have to be patient with people. This is a needed discussion because there's so much content and there's so much information about praying for a future spouse or waiting to be found or God sent and counterfeit. And there's so much intel praying about that, but we need more messages that implore us to increase our patience meter because the impatient heart cannot be the loving heart. Did you hear what I just said? An impatient heart cannot be a loving heart. This is countercultural preaching, y'all. This is countercultural preaching because the era that we live in and the society that we live in is all about your cutoff game. My cutoff game strong. I'll cut a heifer off real quick. Somebody talk to me some type of way. I'll cut people off. We even hear sermons and pastors preaching messages about cutting people off. And my problem is, how is it we have a stronger cutoff game, but we're not as strong with extending grace? So I need to be able to identify in this cutoff game culture and your cutoff game is strong. What if this is somebody that you're supposed to love through? And I understand the famine the famine of this reality and of this kingdom principle is why I believe most marriages and relationships go short-lived because we haven't been taught, we haven't been trained, nor discipled that love is patient. And people should be able to tell how much of a Christ follower you are by your patience ability, okay? So now I think we have to ask ourselves this question. Do you have any stick to itness. Christians should be the last one to fold. We never fold. If you don't know what fold means, it's like a millennial terminology and Generation Z terminology is I don't give up. We should be the last ones to throw in the towel, the last ones to fold, the last one to look for an exit, the last one to quit because we have been wired to long suffer. And now I think the quintessential question is, especially for those of us who claim to be Christ followers, and if you're married, are you claim to be in love and want love, is do you have the ability to love beyond the not yet? I just think God gave me this definition. Patience is the ability to survive the not yet. Patience is the ability. Please hear me. Patience is is the ability to survive the not yet. Has their credit score improved? Not yet. Has your prayer come into fruition? Not yet. Do you see any evidence that God really told you that? Not yet. Have they started putting the lid back on the toothpaste? Not yet. Have they started cleaning up their bed like you told your child to? Not yet. Have they got over the insecurity? Not yet. The doubt? Not yet. The suicidal thoughts? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It's the not yet. And can you live in the midst of not yet? And do you have enough discernment to be able to discern this not yet is a red flag or this not yet means I need to extend my grace somebody say not yet not yet God told us I want you to go into all nations baptize them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age so he's saying I need you to go out and represent me 
I need you to go out and tell other people about me. I need you to go out and make me look good. If you didn't know, I want you to know on tonight, you are a kingdom representative. You are a billboard that shows off the glory of God. He says, I need you to go out and I need you to make me look good because somebody's transformation, please hear me, somebody's transformation is directly connected to your ability to see beyond the not yet. Somebody's transformation is connected to your ability and my ability to see beyond the not yet. Somebody's deliverance is tied to your obedience. Woo! Somebody's deliverance is tied to your obedience, but do you have the grace capacity to help disciple a person who's never been discipled and overlook and be patient when you encounter their many not yet? I just firmly believe we don't need more lectures, we need more love. Because it's a problem when you can speak in tongues but you mean in English. Or whatever native tongue that you... It's a problem when you can speak in tongues but you can't use that same tongue to speak good things to other people. That's the problem. You discover they're not yet issue, don't bad mouth them, don't go behind their back. How about train them, disciple them? But people don't want to get their hands dirty because that's trench work right there. That you don't get a title for that right there. You're not in the spotlight for that right there. That's in the trenches, that's in the mud, that's when it's dirty, that's life on life, but that's the work of the Great Commission. Don't bad mouth them. Why are you talking behind their back? They might just need you to train them, to show them the light. And do you have the patience to do that? You know why I believe people talk behind your back? I got a few reasons. Y'all ready for this? I believe, number one, or A, the reason people talk behind your back is when they can't reach your level. They can't reach your level. They can't stand a light that they can't eclipse. And since they can't reach your level, they talk behind your back. B, the reason I believe people talk behind your back is when they don't have what you have. So they have an envy issue, so now they're going to badmouth you because they don't have what you have, nor can they reach your level. C, I believe the reason people talk behind your back is because they took offense instead of taking notes. Listen, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. This is the methodology of God. Whenever God is getting ready to take you to a next level, he always drops next level in front of you. Did you hear what I just said? When God's getting ready to take you to another level, he drops next level in front of you for the purpose of you to take notes, not take offense. And you could be jealous about the very person that God is trying to show you a paradigm of what next level looks like because God has a way of showing you what's yours before it's yours. You don't believe me? Ask David. He had to be in a palace when somebody else was wearing a crown when he was anointed to be king. This was the palace that he would be king in, but God showed him what was his before it was his. Same thing with Ruth she was begging in a field that was hers and you got to get this that God will show you next level to show you this is what it takes for the next level this is what you're going to be doing at the next level don't get jealous get inspired okay I'm gonna leave that alone D the reason I believe people talk behind your back is because they don't have patience they lack patience they don't have the patience to help you turn your not yet into a I used to Every Christian should have a used to, not a still do. Not a still do. And the transformation work is when we have many used to's, not many still do's. And the reason people talk behind your back is because they, they have a still do themselves and they don't want to help train you to get your still do to be a used to. So since they don't have the capacity to see beyond your not yet because of all their not yet, they badmouth you. All right. And E, the reason I believe people talk behind your back is because they tried to copy you but can't. You can fake a lot of things, but you can't fake oil. You can fake a lot of things, but you can't fake oil. And sometimes they have so much to say because they're not an oil carrier themselves. I've never been hated on by another oil carrier. Just maybe. Maybe your breakthrough, maybe your miracle is on the other side of your patience. Just maybe the very thing that you're asking God to do is on the other side of your obedience and on the other side of your patience. Maybe you don't need a different spouse. I'm about to get in trouble. Maybe you don't need a different spouse. Maybe you don't need a different career. Maybe you don't even need a different church. Maybe you don't need a different community. You don't even need a different small group. What you need is a different word, and that word is patience. 
Patience. We're so quick to label, they did this, and this they problem, and they did this, and I can't stand this, and I, maybe you need a different word, patience. What is on the other side of your patience? Can I get everybody to say other side? I feel like Adele. The other side of this. There's something on the other side. You'll never say hello to the other side if you, ever, if you don't ever say goodbye to this current side. All right, so let me show you this. John chapter 21, verse 6. This is Jesus now. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Okay. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. I want you to notice this. Same boat, same people. Same net, same weather, different word. That's all it was. Same conditions, same boat, same net, same people, just a different word that they put into principle, and that was other side. And I want us to understand that there's some things on the other side of your patience. There's a blessing on the other side of your patience. There's results on the other side of your patience. There's answered prayer on the other side of your patience. But do you have the patience to be patient for what you've been patiently asking God to send you? Y'all going to have to just rewind that and watch it back when it's up. God, to me, is so dope. He's so fly, so powerful. I'm not just blown away by the love of God, but like I'm impressed by God's, his creative ability and his accuracy. Like he's just super brilliant. He knew the exact distance, like the mathematical equation from the earth to the sun, he knew had to be 93 million miles because if it was too close, it would be too hot. And if it's too far, it would be too frigid. God cares so much about the small things that he'll provide a polar bear with a thick enough coat to live in an Arctic climate and then have a different type of coat for the feline that it will shed in a hot atmosphere. God is just so dope. And there's like this thing going on between like plants and the sun called photo photosynthesis and God wired it to where plants let off oxygen as a waste product and then mankind will grab that oxygen consume it and then release off carbon dioxide and then the plants will grab the carbon dioxide consume it and release it and the circle of life circle you thought that was a Lion King thing the circle of life Jehovah was on this back in the day this is not just a big bang theory a big bang theory can't be that accurate we're talking about perfection he knows all things God did this he stretches out the heavens like a curtain knows every single star in the sky by name knows how many hair follicles you got on your head this is impressive to me we're just talking about basic things like the law of gravity and the, the, the law of, of like matter and the law of physics. But there's this other law that blows my mind, and that is the law of grace. The law of grace. We came together and we talked about how grace is our amazing attorney because some way and somehow she keeps getting our case dismissed. Don't y'all mess with me. Somehow, see, it's almost like grace specializes in erasing the evidence. Is there anybody, there's no evidence on you, there's no residue on you of what you used to do? Grace specializes in that. It makes me think about Jesus when he was about to be crucified and Peter had his sword when they rolled up on Jesus because Peter was a real one. Even though he denied him, he had like some gangster to him because he had a knife and they rolled up on Jesus and Peter swiped and cut this dude's ear off and Jesus was like, put up your sword for the cup that my father have given me shall I not surely drink it? I could call on thousands of legions of angels and they could come to defend me, but yet how would the scriptures be fulfilled? And Jesus does his last earthly miracle. He grabs this man's ear and he puts it back to his right, rightful location so that if they tried to convict Peter of assaulting an officer, they couldn't do it because Jesus erased the evidence. I wish we had a church right now of somebody who could give God praise that he erases the evidence. Grace erases the evidence. But here's my problem. Why is it we are so thankful we are so thankful and so grateful for receiving grace, but then, <laughs> then we start <coughs> choking <coughs> when it's time to extend the language of grace. <laughs> so I want grace, but I'm not really swift with giving grace. And then we get churchy with it. God ain't through with me yet. <laughs> God ain't through with me yet. I, I'm, I'm not there yet. But then we're thankful for grace. And I just have a question for you. If God was patient with us during our rebellion, 
Why can't we be patient with him during our becoming? I'm going to put my foot on the gas and go a little further. If God was patient with us during our rebellion, why can't we be patient with others as they're becoming? Okay, I'm about to mess up your theology for a second. There is an upgraded version on the inside of you and on the inside of me. But God knows the only way this upgraded version is going to come out is by love. Did you hear what I just said? God knows there's a you on the inside of you. And the only way that you is going to come out is it has to be loved out. I hope y'all are ready for this. Okay. And I'm not talking about romance. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Somebody watching this message. See, God, this is confirmation. I knew I needed to debate. I knew I needed to debate. There's another me that got to come out. So God's about to. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about a romance love. I'm talking about a collision course encounter with the love of Jesus. There's a you on the inside of you that the only way it's going to come out is it has to be loved out. When you have a collision course encounter with the love of Jesus and you recognize how much he loves you and how much he cares for you and how he has plans for you and he's not mad at you, but he's mad about you and he wants to prosper you and he wants to answer your prayers as long as they're in accordance with his will. When you understand that love, it begins to make you change. This is going to mess up all the religious messages because I used to think that God, like if I didn't do what he wanted, I was going to immediately feel the wrath of God. But as I read my Bible, it says it's his goodness. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It's the fact that he loves you and he does good to us even when we done wrong. It's like when you did something that you had no business doing and you just get a random raise. When you just talk to somebody the way that you shouldn't have talked to them and you just get random good news. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. Has God ever done something so powerful to you? Something so massive for you and you know you just live foul. You know you just did something that you weren't supposed to do but it was because of God's love that you're like, I got to get my life right. I got to pray. I got to fast. God's been too good for me to live like this. It's going to come out through love. Can I get everybody to say love? Okay. So we have to understand this. I'm about to mess you up. This means the person who struggles with patience is the person who lacks understanding of God's love. Did you hear what I just said? If you're an individual, listen. <laughs> I just don't have the patience, you know. I just don't have patience. You don't understand God's love. Because the person who recognizes that they have been forgiven, here we go. The person who recognizes that they have been forgiven, it should be easier for them to forgive. Because you understand God has been patient with me. And God has loved me. And it's his goodness that leads me to repentance. Jesus says it this way for those that are messing up your theology. Jesus gives this parable that there was this man who owed a master some debt. And the master came to him and asked him, where is the money that he owed him? And he said, look, I don't have it. Please be merciful unto me. And the master forgave him of all his debt. And so he walks away free and he runs up on somebody who owes him some debt. And he begins to choke him. He begins to choke him and say, pay what you owe me. He says, man, I don't have it. Please, I, I just don't have it. And he punishes that individual. Now, when the master heard about this, he says, hmm, this is messed up because the same amount of grace that I gave this person, you would think that they would give the other person because I forgave them. I'm going to punish him. I'm going to punish his wife. I'm going to punish his baby mama and his kids. This is how we ought to forgive. Because when God has forgiven you, you should be able to forgive others. Ah, so if you're saying I lack patience, you really lack understanding of God's love. You don't understand what God did for you. You don't understand how merciful God has been to you because if you did, then you would get to a place where you're like, you know what? Since he forgave me, I can forgive you. And I just believe if the upgraded version of you could have a conversation with the current you, I believe the current you'd be like, uh, yes, it does take all that. It does take for you to pray like that. It does take for you to fast like that. You want to get on this side, you got to stop eating potato chips like that. You got to start fasting like that. You got to let that bitterness go because you know what bitterness is? Bitterness is drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Bitterness just contaminates the container. You're going to have to let that go because you want to get here though, right? You want to be free, right? You want to be a free worshiper. You want to be all that stuff, right? Well, for you to get over here, you're going to have to let that go. You're going to have to release that and you gonna have to have some patience because it took time for you to get like this it took time for you to be patient with you how are you patient with other people but you're not patient with yourself that's what i believe 
the conversation will sound like if the upgraded version of you could have a conversation with the current version of you. Now, Jesus says, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the age. But if you stop for a second, in the word disciple, the root word is discipline. What if I told you that self-love is the highest form of discipline? Discipline is the highest form of self-love because he says, listen, I need you to go out and make disciplined people. And how, are the, how in the world are you going to make disciplined people and not have patience? Because I'm trying to help people who have never understood the beauty of the gospel understand the beauty of the gospel. And that's going to take patience. Somebody say patience. So this makes me believe that sometimes the issue with the church is we have churches that are extremely disciplined but lack love. Because we haven't understood that love is a spiritual depth. And then we have churches that have spiritual depth and love but they lack discipline. What does this look like? Y'all can speak in tongues but you can't manage a budget. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. So therefore, this ruins the whole love at first sight principle. Because how can I be patient at first sight? My wife is fine. But when I saw her, I wasn't like, girl, you, you just made me want to deny my flesh. Just looking at you, I just want to die to me, you so fine. I just want to love you like Christ loved the church. You know what? I'm going to embrace all your not yet. You that fine, girl. No. Love is patient. So this means you have to learn how to be patient. This also debunks the whole, I just fell in love with him. I just fell in love with her. How do you fall in patience? <laughs> How do you fall in long suffering? This is something that has to be taught. Please get this. Patience is developed, not a feature. It is not a battery included attribute. And a lot of us think we'll just get it, but it's going to take time. Patience is the evidence of the regenerated work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And it takes work and surrender. It takes surrender and work. So watch this. If it takes work, you can't have a poor spiritual work ethic. And if it takes surrender, this means you got to trust. This means you got to trust that God is going to come through clutch. This means that you got to trust that God is going to work everything out for the good of those who love the Lord and serve him. It takes trust. Okay. The goal is to be so healed that you can love like you've never been hurt before. That's the goal. Because if by this all men will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another, the goal should be I got to be so healed where I can love like I've never been hurt. Because I have a kingdom to represent. And I can't represent the kingdom when I'm not over what hurt me. And the reason I firmly believe we get, in, we get into seasons where we don't know how to handle patients is because we are mislabeling them, all right? So we're going to end with this. There's moves. Please listen. There's moves, there's seasons, there's shifts, and there's atmospheres, okay? There's moves, there's seasons, there's shifts, and there's atmospheres, all right? A move. There will never be a movement without their first being moved people. I've been to so many events and so many churches where people are saying, we're expecting a move of God. We want a mighty move of God. You are the move of God. You literally are the hands and the feet of Jesus. You and I are the move of God. So I think the question is, maybe the reason we feel as though things aren't happening is because we haven't understood that miracles are motion activated. Miracles are motion activated. It's almost like God has this like method. When I move, you move. Just like that. When I move, you move. Just like that. If you don't move, I don't move. Just like that. If you move, he'll move. I can prove it. You'll never know the miracle of you being a water walker if you don't do the motion and step out of the boat. The woman with the issue of blood will never have known that she could have got healed if there wasn't some motion. I just see a marriage between motion and miracles and miracles and radicals. If you don't get radical, if you don't make a move, maybe you're mislabeling it. This is not a closed door. This is a motion activated door. It won't open until you move. Somebody say move. It's the first thing. Moves. There will never be a move without there being moved people. Number two, seasons. Now, seasons are unavoidable. 
But the thing about seasons is we don't have to allow a season to become a state. We don't have to allow a season to become a state. So there is a difference between getting dressed versus getting ready. Y'all ever pull up to your friend's house and say, hey, we're going to leave at 730, and you pull up at 730, and you hit them up, and you be like, all right, I'm here, let's go. And they're like, all right, I'm ready, but they're not dressed. <laughs> See, this is the same thing when we say, God, hey, I'm ready. God's like, no, you're not. You're getting dressed. And if you can't discern that season, you'll be expecting God to send you a husband. But God's like, no, I have to undress you from your ex. And so you're mislabeling the season. And so now you feel as though you're being impatient or although God hasn't heard you. But really, it's you haven't discerned the season. And there is nothing more dangerous when you cannot discern your season. And usually the reason we can't discern our season is due to comparison and due to fear and due to loneliness. So we don't know what season we're in. And the danger of loneliness is if the wrong person gives us the right attention, we'll entertain toxicity. Be able to know your season. This is the season of God healing me. This is the season of God uh, restoring me. I have to be able to recognize expiration dates. Because if you can't recognize expiration dates, you risk consuming stuff that's spoiled. Say in a relationship, well, they used to be like this. They used to do this. They used to, I have never drank milk that used to be good. <laughs> it expired. What if I told you to change your perspective? Maybe they didn't leave you, they just expired. Maybe they didn't reject you, they, they just expired. Maybe you didn't get laid off, your season expired. If you don't recognize expiration dates, you'll be calling yourself impatient about something and you don't even know why you're going through all this, but the truth is that it's expired. Now here goes to the next one, shift, okay? Shift. Before I go to shift, I forgot. There was one time when my wife and I moved into this house, right? And I don't know nothing about agriculture at all. But I just thought our house would look nice with some flowers, right? So I go out here and I plant these flowers because I saw my neighbors had flowers and everything. And I'm watering these flowers every day, y'all, every single day. My last name is Flowers. It just makes sense to just have these flowers in front of our house. You get it? Flowers, flowers. So I'm watering these flowers. And no matter how much I water them, these things keep dying. I go up to Home Depot and I'm like, hey. I, you know, I plant these flowers. I got the, got the soil. I got the water. And they're just not growing. And he said, oh, that's cute. It's October, bro. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's October. It, it, they, they're not going to grow right now. And I'm like, but I'm watering it every day, and it's still kind of hot outside. It's like, yeah, just because, you know, it, it's warm doesn't mean the plants don't know what they're supposed to do in this season. And so I was frustrated and I was upset and I was exerting all this energy. I'm talking about Google and stuff. I was on YouTube University trying to figure out everything to get these flowers to grow. I'm digging around it, seeing if there's stuff all or it was the wrong season. And a lot of us are working really hard for things. And if you can't discern your season, you'll be trying to reap the benefits of March, but you're in October. Somebody say shift. Shift is when God moves you. When God moves you and when God moves, it's one thing for you to make a move because you're the hands and feet of Jesus. It's another thing when God has moved, okay? This is what religious people are. They're in love with where God used to be. <laughs> They're in love with where God used to be, and they don't understand that there has been a shift. And we see this. I did a whole series about appetites. We see this with the children of Israel. God shifted them from Egypt, and he was going to shift them into Canaan, but they never allow God to shift them internally. So God could shift you externally, but if you don't allow him to shift you internally, your internal diet can make you be, make you be in a place where you never allow yourself to actually shift to the degree where God wants to take you to where you die in the wilderness. Somebody say shift. Last one, atmospheres. Could you be impatient because of your atmosphere? And think about it. Our nation and our world, they can contribute to your issue. So like on Valentine's Day, it creates an atmosphere that if you don't have somebody, you could be lonely. And you'll begin to question yourself and question what God is doing. And has he heard my prayers? And when is this going to happen? And you are allowing an atmosphere that is not supposed to be your atmosphere to get you to question who you are. There's a certain atmosphere that God needs for the miraculous. There's a certain atmosphere that God needs. And what he's trying to do in this season, could it be, I'm trying to give you patience. Trying, I've said this many times before, God does not microwave, he crockpots. I'm trying to give you patience. 
I'm trying to give you patience. There's a miracle on the other side of your patience. I know you're asking me, can you please hurry up? But what God does in us while we wait is more important than what we're waiting for. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. God is trying to give you patience, literally. Like when Jesus went to Lazarus' grave, and he said, Lazarus, come out. And then he told the boys around him, he said, now y'all loose him. Patience is God unloosing all the stuff that caused you to be in the grave. All the stuff that caused you to pick up a stench. All the stuff that caused you to lose your identity. All the stuff that broke your heart. All the stuff that made you lose your focus. All the stuff that made you question who you are. I got to untie that. I'm going to untie that. And for Christians, we're supposed to help untie people. But we have to be so sound and we have to be so secure that we don't let the stench of their grave clothes offend us so much to where we don't untie them. Do you have the patience to live in the not yet? And I don't know who this is for, but many of us have many not yets that have happened. And what I'm trying to get you to see on tonight is maybe... It's not a trust issue. It's a patient issue. There's miracles on the other side of your patience. And one of the qualities, one of the qualities that every Christ follower must have is the ability to endure. The ability to endure. Never let doubt make you dig up what you planted in faith. So, Father, we pray. You increase our patience meter because you told us in your word, love is patient. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the way we love one another. Help us to be patient. Help us to put our trust in you. And in the place of not yet, let us not get so discouraged that we leave the very place that's needed for us to become what we need to become. That next level, that upgraded version of ourselves, help it to come out, God, through the love encounter that we've had with you. We're asking for it to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. This Amen. all men will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another and love is patient so people will be able to see how much we're like jesus also by our ability to be patient i pray that this message blessed your life thank you every single week for you guys coming on and supporting and commenting and sharing and having watch parties and tagging us on ig and tagging us on facebook you are blowing our mind we are just honored to serve you and be ready on thursday part three of this try me series is on its way I love you very much, my wife and I. I'm thankful for your support. I'll see you soon.